Good morning. Beautiful, beautiful rain we're having. It's going to make beautiful flowers. Why don't we stand and worship our God this morning?
Great, as you find your seats, let's continue this morning. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory, hallelujah. Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory, hallelujah. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory, hallelujah. Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory, hallelujah. Here comes Jesus, all hail King Jesus. It is a great day to come and praise the Lord together. It's good to have you with us. We have a dreary day outside today, and the weather is supposed to be bad all day today, so we are going to cancel Sunday evening service tonight just so you can stay home and no need to come out through the weather tonight. But we have a lot of things going on I want to make you aware of. Make sure you read through the bulletin. Uh, coming up on this Wednesday is our food distribution. If you want to help out, you can see uh, Sharon Wood and let her know that. Uh, we'll have lots of helpers every month and lots of people ministered as they receive a box of food. If you know anyone who would benefit by having a box of food, encourage them to come out Wednesday from 1 to 2.30. Uh, next Sunday, Easter Sunday, will be a wonderful time for us and uh, we'll have uh, a bunch of lilies here decorating the sanctuary. If you'd like to purchase a lily to uh, dedicate in honor or memory of someone, there's a box at the back. You can fill out a slip, and then after the service, you can take the lily home with you. Uh, we'll have a breakfast uh, Sunday at 9.30. Love to have you come out. Free breakfast, just a wonderful time to fellowship and celebrate together. 
Uh, two weeks from today, we'll have the Str Stronghold Quartet with us, and so we will have a, a wonderful morning of music and worship as well, and so hopefully you can bring some friends along with you that Sunday as well. So a lot of great things coming up. One of the joys we have every week is giving back to the Lord who has blessed us so richly. And so we take an offering every week to give back to honor the Lord. And so at this time, the ushers are going to come as we give as unto the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you have given us the privilege of giving. Sometimes we view it as a chore and we understand that is the wrong way of viewing it. Rather, it is a delight to praise you for all your blessings. And so because you have blessed us, Lord, we want to honor you. We pray that as we give, that you would use what's given for your glory. Remind us that uh, our security is in you alone, and uh, we look to you every day to provide for us for our needs. And so we love you, and we thank you for the chance to give. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, join me in turning to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, toward the end of the New Testament, in the end of your Bible, Hebrews chapter 10. Our Bible is a collection of various books, letters, songs, works of poetry and prophecy, and they are broken down into different books having different chapters and each chapter is broken down into sections called verses that help us to find and process the content easier sometimes we take for granted that everybody knows that everybody understands that 
Uh, but I remember once somebody saying, what's John 3, 16, what's the 3 and what's the 16 and what's the little colon in the middle? Uh, we sometimes forget when we've been raised in church all of our life that there are many people who don't understand how the scripture is written. The letter we are looking at, the letter to the Hebrews, is written to Hebrews, also called Jews. Today we would call them Israelis. They are the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the patriarchs of a family line that begins all the way back in the beginning, in the book of Genesis. So the Hebrews are Jewish in nationality and in religion. And the author of this letter writes to a group of Jews who have experienced salvation. In the beginning of Hebrews, he calls them brothers. Uh, they are those who saw Jesus as their promised Messiah. But even though they came to faith in Jesus, they were tempted to go back to following all the rules and regulations of the sacrificial system that they had known under the Old Testament Mosaic Law. And so the author of Hebrews tells them that faith in Jesus Christ is far superior to the sacrificial system of the Old Testament law. And this letter of Hebrews begins in chapter 1, talking about the absolute superiority of Jesus. As chapter 1 begins, I grew up, had memorized several chapters in Hebrews in the King James Version. God, who at various times and divers' manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Very poetic language. Uh, but this morning, I want to read it out of the New International Version. It gives us a little bit more modern wording. It says, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Son, that is Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand, of the majesty in heaven. So we see from the very start, Jesus is God become man. The image of God in human form. He became one of us so that he could die for us and reconcile us to God. Apart from Jesus, we would have no hope. And the author of Hebrews then goes on to compare Jesus Christ with all the features of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the old way of relating to God. Because he's writing to Jews, and he wants them to see that Jesus is better than angels. Jesus is better than Moses, better than all the prophets, better than Joshua, better than Aaron, better than all the priests in the sacrificial system that they had grown up under. The covenant Christ makes with us is so much better than the Old Testament system. The passage here in chapter 10 that we're going to look at today serves as the final bookend of a section that is showing Jesus as our high priest. And both the beginning and the ending passage have similar wording. So that whole section begins at chapter 4, where it says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So, great verses from the end of Hebrews, Hebrews 4, 15, 16. Verses that tell us that God invites us to come to Him. And when we have a need, we can find grace and mercy from our God. Because Jesus is our high priest, we have direct access to God. We have an intimate relationship to the God of all creation because of what Jesus has done for us. 
And so from chapter 4 on through chapter 10, several chapters talking about Jesus as our high priest, the one who intercedes for us, the one who brings us back into right relationship to God. And then that passage, this, the final bookend, is here in chapter 10, where it repeats a lot of similar themes, starting down in verse 19. Uh, this morning, we're actually going to read the passage responsively. So I have the verses on the screen. I'll read the first part. You respond with the next. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus... And since we have a great priest over the house of God, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water, well, let me continue on. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Let's pray together. Father, we do look forward to the day, the day of your return for us. And every day we say like John, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for these words that encourage us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to encourage one another every day. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to take uh, seriously the encouragement you give us in this passage to draw near to you. Now, as we look at your word, we pray that you would teach us. Open our eyes to see the truth of your word and how it applies to our lives. Speak to us today, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. This is an incredible section of scripture. We're going to camp out here over the next couple weeks looking at some of these verses because the ideas of this passage fit well into the events of Palm Sunday and Easter. The passage begins with the words in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. This is a passage that the author talks about an image where every Hebrew in the first century would have been familiar with. During the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, back in the days of Moses, God met with the Jews in a tent that was in the center of their camp. It was called the tabernacle, which is a word that simply means tent. In that tent, the most holy place was also called the holiest of all or the holy of holies. That was in the back half of the tent. And as the millions of Jews camped around it, there in the center of the camp, they could see the presence of God with them indicated by a pillar of cloud by day or a pillar of fire by night. And just like the flag flying at Buckingham Palace indicates when the Queen of England is present there, so as the pillars of cloud or fire, as the people would see those over the tabernacle, they would be reminded that God's presence was with them in the camp. But even though they saw the signs of God's presence, they were never allowed to enter that tent, the tabernacle. Only the priests who served as intermediaries, who spoke to God on behalf of the people, who spoke to the people on behalf of God, only the priests were allowed to enter the tent. And then they could only enter the front half of the tent, in the back half, the most holy place. Only one priest, the high priest, could enter only once a year on the great day of atonement. And it was in that back room that the high priest would intercede with, the, with God for the people. Now, our passage in Hebrews says that we, 
can enter the most holy place. The word enter here means admission, authorization for access. Christians have authorization for access to the very presence of God. That's something that the Mosaic Law never offered for any Jew. Under the Old Testament system, Jews worshipped God, but they were separated from God. But with Jesus as our high priest, the people of God find access to the very presence of God on a continual basis. I was uh, in the Shiawassee County Jail the other week, not as a prisoner, as a visitor, but I was with Sheriff Brian Bagol, so I had authorization for access. Locked doors were open because I was with the sheriff. In the same way, Jesus gives us direct access to our God. So the author of Hebrews, who has been declaring to us how much better the new covenant is than the old covenant, all the rules and regulations of the Old Testament law, now sets forth that we have direct access to God. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 and a quarter days a year. We have direct access to the one true God. So the Old Testament law was done away with because God does not simply want us just trying to follow a lot of rules and regulations that never bring us any closer to Him. God wants us to live out of a personal relationship with Him. Galatians 3 tells us, So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, so that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. In other words, the Old Testament laws were never given to make us right with God. They were given to show us that we are not right, that we are sinners, that we are guilty, condemned under the penalty of our sin. And that verse says we are justified by faith, not by our works. Galatians 2.16 says, Know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ, not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. So that verse can be a little complex with some big wording, but let's put it in everyday language. You aren't made right in the sight of God by what you can do. You are put into a right relationship with God by faith in what Jesus Christ has already done for you. Verse 19 says, We have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. The blood refers to Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, giving his life as he took our sins upon himself. And because of that, we can live out a life of grace. So many people try to do things to make themselves right with God. But no amount of good works can ever make God love us anymore. No amount of good works can ever make us right in the eyes of God. But as we trust by faith in what Jesus Christ has done for us, we receive forgiveness. We receive salvation. God offers us His grace, His unmerited grace favor god loves to bless us not because of anything we have done but because he loves us and god wants you to love him to relate to him to spend time with him to walk with him to love him from the heart so jesus gives us direct access to god that comes by faith and as a result it says we have confidence the word confidence is the idea of boldness the message of hebrews 10 is that christ sacrifice for us gives us boldness in how we live hebrews challenges us to live boldly far too often we live timidly we live in fear we fear satan we fear being mocked for our faith we fear losing our salvation we have all kinds of fears 
But as believers in Christ, we are called to be bold because we have that direct access to God, who back in chapter 4 says we come boldly to his throne to find grace to help in time of need. So verse 20 here in chapter 10 continues on in explaining what is true. By a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. The most holy place, the back room of the tabernacle, was separated from the front room, the holy place, by a curtain that went from the ceiling to the floor. When Jesus was crucified, something so significant happened that all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, all record this same event. Matthew 27, 50 recounts it. It says, And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Visible ripping of that curtain showed all the Jews that now we have direct access to God. The curtain that separated us has been ripped. It was ripped from the top to the bottom. Man didn't initiate this. God initiated it. The separation that had existed is no longer there. God made a way for us to come into direct access to his presence. So the way into the most holy place, into the, direct, into the presence of God, now is through the curtain of Jesus' body, crucified for us. The word translated as new here can mean previously, un, may, previously unavailable. Jesus has made available to us that which previously we had been unable to have, that access to God. The word literally is freshly slain, which has a beautiful picture when we think about Jesus uh, being slain for us. In Revelation 5, we see the chorus that is sung in heaven. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. So through his body, freshly slain for us, Jesus provides a way for us to have fellowship with God. Remember what Jesus says to his disciples at the Last Supper. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's interesting that early Christians called themselves followers of the way. Jesus is the way to have access to God. So Jesus provides us a better way than the Old Testament laws. The Old Testament laws never made anyone right. They only convicted people of their sin. But Jesus, through his sacrifice of himself, provides us access. So the passage continues on in verse 21. And since we have a great priest over the house of God. Now we need to stop there and think about what is true. Realize that this building is not the house of God even though we sometimes might call it that. You are the house of God. I am the house of God. Our bodies are the house of God. God doesn't just hang out in this building all week long. Rather, he lives with inside of us. That was the question that the woman at the well had in John 4. The Jews worshipped at the temple in Jerusalem. The Samaritans worshipped at their temple and she says well where does god dwell you know is it what you jews say or what we samaritan believes who's right and jesus answers her a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for they are the kind of worshipers the father seeks god is a spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth so Jesus told her, where you worship isn't the important thing. How you worship, that's what's important. Sadly, many times we get caught up with the where. We get jealous of other churches in town. We say, well, we want people to come to our church. But let's realize that we should rejoice for every other church in town that is preaching the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ. They're not our competitors, they're our teammates. Because where we worship isn't what is important. 
We can worship wherever we are because wherever we are, that's where God is. Because we house God in our bodies as Christians. Paul writes to the Christians at the city of Corinth and tells them, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? So as Christians, God lives in us, so wherever we are, we can worship. And when we truly worship God, we don't get caught up in all the externals that so often distract us. Sometimes we think worship should be all about me, all about the things I like. But that's not true. Worship is all about our God. We worship to an audience of one. We need to make sure that when we worship, we are focused on our God and expressing to Him how much He means to us. There is a speaker named Zig Ziglar, once in one of his conferences, asked the question, he said, how many of you, you have ever been in a boring worship service? And a lot of hands were raised. He said, you're wrong. There is no such thing as a boring worship service. You may have been in a boring church service, but you've never been in a boring worship service because worship is one of the most exhilarating things that there is. When we truly are worshiping, we're not focused on what song they're singing. We're not focused on the person beside us. Our focus is in our God. Verse 19 uses the word since. In light of what is true, since we have access to God and Jesus who intercedes for us to God, what does that mean for us? How should that change us? What should we do? So here's our application point. We see what's true, and then we see how it affects us. Verse 22 Therefore, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. In light of the fact that we have authorized access to God, we should use that access. What good is access if you don't use it? I could join five or six different gyms and fitness centers, but... I wouldn't tone up my body unless I use those memberships. It's interesting if you look here in the middle with all these gym cards, Wendy's, hamburgers. <laughs> uh, that's not quite the gym you think of. But having a lot of gym memberships doesn't help unless we actually use them. So having access to God really doesn't help us unless we use that access. So what does God want us to do in light of the access we have? Use it. Draw near to God. You want to know what God's will for your life is? Here it is. Draw near to God. God wants us to draw near to Him. That's what we should do, but many times we fail to do the very thing we know we should be doing. So let's think. What are some things that keep us from drawing near to God. First, there is insincerity. Often we don't come to God because we are insincere. We really could care less about drawing near to God. We don't word it that way, but that's really the truth. God's not a priority in our lives. We, we don't say that. What we say is we want to come to God after we get our life straightened out. We want to read our Bibles after the game's over, or after the movie is finished. We want God to bless our families and our marriages, but we'll start following God after life isn't so busy as it is right now. The truth is, when we say those things, we're liars. God is not important in our lives if he's not a part of our lives. So the first thing that often keeps us from God is insincerity. Verse 22 gives us the answer to that. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. A sincere heart is one that is genuine, one that is true one that is not 
hiding something. John 4, 24 tells us God is the Spirit. His worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So God wants us to come to Him with a true, sincere heart that truly desires a relationship with Him. So take a moment to think about your heart. Do you really have a genuine desire to draw near to God? Or if you're honest, is relationship with God a little lower down on the priority list? Our relationship with God should be top priority in our lives. Sometimes we don't draw near because we are ashamed. We feel guilty. We're in the wrong and we know it, and just like Adam and Eve, we hide from God. But instead of hiding from God, realize that God wants us to face up to the truth of what we are really like, and we come to Him as we are. He already knows what we're like, so we don't have to hide and pretend that we are something we're not. One of my favorite musicians was a man named Rich Mullins. Uh, and Rich was a maverick. He, he never conformed to the expected things that society uh, wanted him to follow. He didn't play by all the rules. There is a movie out about his life called Ragamuffin, and it shows all the raw, ugly sides of his life. But that's who he was. He was honest about his shortcomings. He knew that God loved him in spite of his shortcomings. We draw near to God with a sincere heart, one that honestly longs to be in relationship with God, one that longs to know Him. Many times we have all sorts of wrong assumptions about what it means to worship. Let's realize that it doesn't matter what kind of clothes you wear. You don't have to dress up in a suit or a fancy dress. You know, next Sunday, Easter Sunday, a lot of people dress up in their finest, and that's fine. How we dress sometimes does reflect the attitude of our hearts, but it doesn't make us right with God. We can worship no matter what type of clothes we wear. It doesn't matter the words we use. Sometimes people, when they pray, will suddenly drop their voice low in a whisper and use old English, you know, we pray that thou wouldest bless us, and all kinds of wording. And it's like, you, you don't talk to people like that. Why would you talk to God like that? And there's nothing wrong with using words like that. But God simply desires that we speak to him from the heart. He wants us to be real and honest, not put on a show. Let's realize that for generations, people have had misconceptions about what it meant to worship. Today is Palm Sunday, a day we remember the crowds who gathered to worship Jesus as he was on his way into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. But the crowds got it wrong. They proclaimed his praise because they were looking to Jesus to embrace their timetable, not for them to get on his timetable. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the crowds took palm branches and started waving their palm branches, which was uh, the symbol of Israel. It'd be like taking a flag and, raise it and waving that flag at a tea party rally. Uh, national patriotism was flying high. People were in a frenzy. The crowd shouted, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, save us. They were words that were on the tongues of every Jew at Passover. That comes from Psalm 118. They were prayers for God to act in a mighty and spectacular way. So they were proclaiming Jesus to be their king, cheering, praising, and exalting. But something happened. The cheering stopped. Because Jesus didn't gather any troops. He didn't lead a revolt against the Romans. He didn't do what they expected. Instead, on that day, he goes into the temple, he heals the blind and the lame, and then he goes home. No big speeches, no rallying the troops, no call to arms, just a simple, peaceful, humble healer. The next day, he drove the money changers out of the temple, but this Jesus was not the hero that the people wanted. He paid tribute to Caesar. He taught that in order to be great, you have to be a servant. Jesus did everything the people didn't want. So the cheering stopped. It's amazing that when things go our way, it's easy to praise God. 
We want to tell everyone when oh, God gave me a raise or uh, my aunt was cured of cancer, praise the Lord. My husband just became a Christian. When God does the things we want, it's easy for us to praise. But what happens when he doesn't do those things? What happens when you face difficulty? What happens when you experience trouble? Do we still praise just as easily? Too often the cheering stops. Words of adoration and praise quickly fade when we face life as it really is. Sometimes God does give us what we want, but realize his greater concern is giving us what we need, what is for our good. And sometimes our wants and desires blur our, blur our vision to our real needs. The same thing happened to the crowds that lined the streets to cheer Jesus. They were focused on what they wanted for themselves. They wanted that king who's going to come and overthrow the Romans. But Jesus saw things as they really were. From Luke 19, it says, As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. They couldn't see Jesus' purpose because they had their eyes on their immediate circumstance. They focused on their situation, but they refused to have faith in Jesus until he did what they wanted. In fact, John 12 says, even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. They didn't want to see that God was at work in the circumstances. They wanted God to change the circumstances. They wanted a kingdom with a king on David's throne. And even the disciples were looking for Jesus to overthrow the Roman soldiers, set up his kingdom on earth. After the resurrection, they asked Jesus, Acts 1, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? In other words, okay, Jesus, you raised from the dead, so now will you set up your kingdom? Now are you going to reign on the throne? And the answer was no, not yet. The king will reign on David's throne one day, but in God's own timing. So Jesus came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, but the crowds did not see the triumphant leader they were looking for. So why did he come into town that day? It was Lamb Selection Day, the day the Jews would pick out the lamb to take home to have ready for their Passover sacrifice. And as Jesus came into town, he was presenting himself as the Passover lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So back to our passage in Hebrews 10. God's desire for us is to draw near to him. What keeps us from that? First of all, insincerity. Often we are more, for, more focused on God giving us what we want than on our giving to God what he wants. The second thing that keeps us from drawing near to God often is a lack of faith. Often we don't come to God because we really don't have faith. We don't believe that God wants a relationship with us. We don't believe that he will bless us if we draw near. Sometimes we doubt the goodness of our God. We would rather enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season instead of eternal, incorruptible riches that God desires to lavish on us for all of eternity. Because Satan offers immediate gratification when we sin. Oh, when we sin, it feels so good instantly. When we choose to follow God, Sometimes it seems like a great struggle for us. But even though we don't feel good right away, we will enjoy the rewards of faithfulness for all eternity. Many times we're like a little boy who'd rather eat stale cracker crumbs that fell on the floor than wait 10 minutes to get to the prime rib buffet. Sometimes we lack faith because of circumstances in life. Maybe someone we loved let us down. Maybe you can't think of God as a loving father because your father was a poor example of a father. 
Many times we are angry because God didn't answer our prayers the way we want Him to. But it tells us here, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. The word for assurance means openness or outspokenness. As we come to God, draw near to God, we can be very real about what we are thinking and feeling. In many of the Psalms, we see that. The psalmist is very raw and gritty. David questions God with words like, Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Why have you forgotten me? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? How long, O God, is the foe to scoff? Is the enemy to revile your name forever? The psalmist uses these very real words to express his feelings toward God. But this is where openness of faith steps in. David shares freely how he feels. But in the midst of his questions, he holds on to his faith. good example is Psalm 10. The psalmist says in verse 1, Why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? But even as he calls out to God, he reaffirms his faith. Down in verse 16 of that psalm, he continues on, The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from his land. Even as the psalmist questions, he also realizes God is in complete control, and he trusts him no matter what. So the idea of drawing near with full assurance of faith is the idea that we can honestly tell God how we feel. We don't have to hide our thoughts and our feelings from God. But at the same time, as we present God our concerns and our questions, we hold on to our faith in Him. Hebrews 11 reminds us, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. We draw near to God being fully assured of what we do not see. We are to believe that God can and will receive us as we draw near to Him. Then a third thing that separates us from drawing near to God is sin. It's our sin that separates us from our God. Even though the blood of Jesus gives us access to our God, the forgiveness from the penalty of those sins, the continued attraction and choice to engage in sin willfully breaks the fellowship we have with God, the relationship, the oneness. So as Christians, we have forgiveness of the penalty of that sin. But when we continue to sin, it breaks the relationship. It breaks the fellowship. Once again, Hebrews has the answer. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. In the Old Testament, the priest had to cleanse himself before he ever entered the tabernacle. He was then able to draw near to God. We have been forgiven of the penalty of our sins when we accept Jesus as Savior. But to Christians, to those who have been forgiven, John writes in the epistle of 1 John chapter 1, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So we need ongoing cleansing to restore our relationship when that relationship gets broken. When we confess our sins, we are saying the same thing. To confess means to say the same thing. We say the same thing about our sin that God says. Yes, God, I admit that was wrong. I was wrong. I sinned. And when we confess our sins, it brings us back into a right relationship with our God. When we admit and confess that what we have done was wrong, there is freedom from guilt. Are you troubled by a guilty conscience? You may be a Christian and on your way to heaven, but you may struggle with feeling guilty about things you have done, 
since you became a Christian. Confession frees us from guilt. When we admit to God what we have done wrong, and we confess that and turn from it, it restores the relationship. So, the problems we face, insincerity, lack of faith, sin, are all dressed in this verse. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. Today, God desires us to draw near to Him, to spend time with Him. And one of the most beautiful things about drawing near to God is how He responds to us. James 4 said, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Humble yourselves before the Lord, he will lift you up. Just like the father in the prodigal son story, when we turn to God, when we draw near to God, he comes running to us. He longs to fellowship with us. He longs to bless us. He waits for us to draw near. He's only ever a prayer away. He invites us to draw near to him today. Big question is, will you? Will we make the choice to use that access we have with our God, to draw near to God, to share our hearts, to pour out our hearts before Him? Will we draw near to God? Let's pray. Father, we admit today how blessed we are, how privileged we are to be able to come before You, the very God of all creation. And we come to You to honestly share our hearts before you first thing lord we we ask that you would help us to stir up that passion to be with you we allow so many things to fill our days and we crowd our time with you out by entertainment by pleasures by activity but lord we pray today that you would help us to prioritize that time with you that we would give you first place in our lives Lord, I pray that you would help us never to try to hide from you, but to honestly share the things we're struggling with because we know that, first of all, you already know. Secondly, you have the help to give us to deal with those issues. And Lord, we realize that many times we are guilty and ashamed of what we've done. But Lord, when we confess, you are so faithful to restore us. It's amazing the way you love us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would encourage us this week to truly draw near to you, to spend time with you, to focus on you. Because we realize that when we draw near to you, our lives will be changed. Thank you for these encourage, encouraging words from the book of Hebrews. Help us, Lord, now to live them out in our lives this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join us as we close our service. Feet may fall. We'll try.
join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you came into this world uh, through this, your son Jesus. Lord, we, we are so grateful that you came as the lamb to be slain for our sins. And Lord, we desire to draw near to you and to be closer to where you are. And we just ask, Lord, as we go out from here, may we be lights to the world that when people look at us, they see you. So uh, bless us this week. In your name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.